Hello everyone, today we are going to discuss uh, interval estimates and goodness of fit. As of now, we have discussed point estimates and there we uh, have gone through two different ways to solve the parameter of a distribution. One is method of moments, another is maximum likelihood and we have discussed how those uh, models actually uh, helps us to identify the parameters of a distribution. Now, sometimes uh, we are interested to know the interval within which the estimate lies rather than uh, a particular value. So, with that the interval estimation comes into picture. So, if we have say x1, x2 up to xn which are IID samples from a population whose PDF f of x, x and theta where theta is the unknown parameter, then we can define two limits t1 and t2 such that probability of theta lying between t1 and t2 is finite. Now, if this interval exists, we call it a confidence interval for theta and the two extremes t1 and t2 are the confidence limit and the probability of theta lying between t1 to t2 which is equal to c in this case is called confidence coefficient. Now, we have already discussed uh, central limit theorem and its application. So, if we draw samples of size n from a population which for the time being uh, we can assume it normal and then our aim is to find out 95 percent confidence limit uh, say for unknown parameter mu in this case, then we have already discussed that x bar, x bar is the sample mean, then it follows normal distribution with population mean mu and sigma square by n as the variance and as n tends to infinity, we have this z, the new variable which is having 0 mean and unit standard deviation. Now, if we see that z actually follows this normal distribution, you can see the pink line on your screen. Now, this normal distribution has 0 mean, so the maximum value of uh, this distribution is at 0, you can see the green line. And then, uh, as we move from mean position on either side, because this is a symmetric curve, and then on either side by a constant interval in this case for example, say these two vertical black lines you can see on your screen, then we can find out this limits for z. Now, if we talk about say 95 percent area under the standard normal curve that means, the area under this pink line bounded by the two black lines on either side of the green line which is at mean. Now then the z, the ordinate where these black lines are drawn, they are at z equal to 1.96. So, on either side of mean, if we go 1.96, we get this two black lines that actually covers 95 percent area under the standard normal distribution. Now, for different confidence limits, you can see for 95 percent the z limit is 1.96, if we increase that limit for 99 percent it is 2.58 and 99.73 it is exactly 3. So, if you cover an area of say mean plus minus 3 sigma, we almost cover the complete distribution. So, in this case our aim is to find out the 95 percent confidence interval and therefore, the probability of z lying between plus minus 1.96 is actually 0.95. That means, the area under the tail end on either side, they cover 5 percent area that means, 2.5 percent on either side. So, the probability now we get that z within 1.96 on either side is actually 0.95. Now, from that we can solve this inequality and then find out the 95 percent confidence limit for the population mean. So, let us take an example. So, among 600 samples taken from a production line, 75 are defective. 
So, evaluate the percentage of defectives in the production line with its confidence limit. So, the solution goes like this, the percentage of defective is in this case p, small p, which is nothing but we have 75 out of 600. So, we can calculate the percentage which is 12.5 percent in this case. Now, our aim is to find out the confidence limit for p covering the complete population. So, in this case confidence limit we define as p plus minus 3 times the standard error for p and which is we already have discussed in case of central limit theorem that standard error of p is square root of p q by n and then from the given uh, information we can actually find out this standard error for p. Now, once that is done we can find the limit for p which is again mean plus minus 3 sigma in this case and then the limit comes out to be 16.55 percent to 8.45 percent. So, we have seen that we can this way find out the intervals within which the parameter is expected to lie. So, let us take a different example. Now, in this case what we have the average diameter of 100 ball bearings drawn from a shipment of 2000 is given that is 0.354 inch while its standard deviation is 0 0.048 inch and the problem statement is estimate 95 percent confidence interval for the average diameter of the complete shipment. So, I draw your attention on this last statement that confidence interval for average diameter of the complete shipment not for the samples drawn that is 100 ball bearing. So, let us see what we are given the sample mean based on 100 ball bearings what we have is 0.354 inch and its standard deviation is 0 0.048. Also what we have done we have drawn n samples from a population of capital N right. So, therefore, 95 percent confidence limit for the population mean mu is again the sample mean plus minus 1.96 times the AC of p. So, we can calculate the standard error on sample mean, but remember we have to actually estimate this for complete shipment and therefore, for complete shipment we have this expression and then in this expression because sigma that is the population mean is not known. So, we can use the approximate value of standard error and then instead of population mean sigma we can use sample standard deviation s and therefore, uh, standard error of mean we can estimate and in this case it turns out to be 0 0.0047. So, in this case we had sample size small n equal to 100 then sample mean given 0.354 sample standard deviation 0 0.048 and then population size is 2000. So, for the 95 percent confidence limit for average diameter of the population now we can estimate and in this case if we just use all these estimated values we get the 95 percent confidence interval and which is 0 0.3448 to 0 0.3632 in inch. Okay, so, let us take a different example. In this case, we have 100 objects which are taken from a production line and it shows 5 faulty items. Our problem is to set up 96 percent confidence limit for the faulty items in the batch. If the batch has 2696 objects, set up 95 percent confidence limit for the objects. So, the solution first problem we have to find out the confidence limit for a given confidence interval for the population size p and then we have already discussed that it is basically that population size plus minus this factor which for a 95 percent was 1.96 for 96 percent it is 2.05 times the standard error of p. So, we can calculate then standard error of p and then we should note that the population size capital P in these cases are known and therefore, we can use sample population small p to estimate standard error. 
then we can estimate standard error and in this case it turns out to be 0 0.022. And therefore, using this standard error, we can find out 96 percent confidence limit for P and which is in this case 0.095 to 0 0.005. So, the first part of the problem is solved, then in the second part, we are supposed to calculate 95 percent confidence limit for population P and then because it is 95 percent, obviously the range will be plus minus 1.96 of the AC of P. However, in this case again, we have a finite population size of capital N. So, again we have already discussed this how to calculate the AC of P, which is approximately the expression you can see on your screen. And then we are given small n that is the sample drawn is 100, the total number of finite sample in this case 2696, then small p is 0 0.05 because it is 5 faulty items out of 100 objects drawn from the production line. And then using these values, we can estimate the standard error and then finally, the 95 percent confidence limit for this standard error using the expression you can see on your screen. So, the limits in this case are from 0 0.008 to 0 0.092 and that addresses the problem. So, what we have seen using the sample statistics, we can actually calculate the interval estimation for a given parameter. So, earlier we discussed point estimates and now uh, we can also estimate the confidence interval for the parameter that we estimate from a given sample. So, with that our discussion on parameter estimation is uh, over and then next topic that we are going to discuss is goodness of fit. Now, before we start, let me just uh, tell you the problem statement why we need particularly in the light of uh, uh, reliability based design of structures. When we actually design a structure, again uh, we deal with different materials, loads, uh, then other variables like geometry of the structures and then all these variables, they are uncertain and then we need to first identify which distribution it follows. As of now, whenever we fit uh, and a distribution and find out uh, our uh, parameters of that distribution, uh, our first starting point is uh, we, uh, we start with the hypothesis. For example, if we uh, deal with compressive strength of concrete, then we can estimate the parameters provided say it follows normal distribution. So, we start with an assumption that it follows normal distribution, then we know what are the parameters of the normal distributions and then either using method of moments or MLE, we can actually estimate those parameters. If we again uh, reconsider the method of moments, we actually develop the number of equations as many unknowns we have. So, in this uh, process, we actually start with the known distribution for a random variable. But the question now comes, how do we know which distribution fits to a particular data? So, we have a sample that represents a population and that population has an underlying distribution with certain uh, parameters. So, first we have to ensure uh, which distribution that uh, population follows and then we can estimate its parameter. So, in this goodness of fit, actually we are trying to investigate that question. Now, in principle what does it do? It determines whether a sample observation truly represents an entire population. So, again if we go back to the um, problem statement with an example say concrete strength then we have certain number of concrete cubes tested in the laboratory. So, we know their compressive strength, those are observations, they represent a population which follows certain distribution. Now, in this goodness of fit, we actually verify how closely the uh, observations actually represent a particular distribution. And this uh, goodness of fit can be, I mean, solved in two different ways using you can see on your screen parametric statistical test and then using non-parametric statistical tests. So, I have listed some of them uh, under these two different categories. 
this list is again not exhaustive, but fairly covers the different tests normally we carry out under these two subgroups. Out of this, in this uh, lecture, we are going to discuss two different models that we use under non-parametric statistical tests. Now, I have already explained uh, with the example of concrete cubes. Again, if I go back to that same example, we have this kind of data on your screen. So, we test these cubes and we get this data and then based on this data, we try to fit a particular distribution which is having certain parameters. Now, that we will do under this non-parametric statistical test category and we will discuss chi-square test and kolmogorov smirnov test. These two tests along with uh, examples we will discuss, but with the main aim to verify whether the proposal that we make regarding the population, whether that is satisfactory or not, that is the main aim. So, our first topic in this is chi-square test. So, let us first review what is chi-square distribution and then we will move over to chi-square test. Now, the square of a standard normal variate is actually a chi-square variate with degrees of freedom 1. So, if we have a random variable say x which is following normal distribution with mean and sigma as the parameters of this distribution, then we define chi-square as x minus mu by sigma whole square. So, as per our definition, this chi-square variate has degrees of freedom 1. Now, imagine if we have a set of random variables say x i, which is following normal distributions with individual parameters mu 1, mu i and sigma i. And then, if we sum the square of this variable, that means, we have n number of variables where i ranging from 1 to n, then sum of the square is also a chi-square variate and in this case, we define chi-square as the summation of i ranging from 1 to n x i minus mu i by sigma whole square. And in this case, because we have n normal variate whose uh, sum of the square is taken as the chi-square variate. So, the degrees of freedom in this case is n, small n. Now, the PDF for chi-square distribution you can see on your screen. This PDF has the gamma function and it has n uh, which is the degrees of freedom for this uh, chi-square distribution. Now, from this distribution, we can also find out mean and variance of this distribution and which is uh, mean is small n and variance is twice n. And this chi-square distribution, you can see on your screen, the blue line actually shows the chi-square distribution, which is having a positive skew and the skewness is 2 by n. So, this chi-square distribution uh, has different applications. Out of that, we will uh, discuss only goodness of fit in this lecture. But before we move forward, how we can use this chi-square distribution to verify the population that we observe through some samples. Before we do that, let us just quickly discuss one of the important property of chi-square distribution. It has an additive property, which means if we have say n number of chi-squares, that means chi 1 square, chi 2 square, this way chi n square and then we have each of them having degrees of freedom n 1, n 2 up to n n respectively. Then summation of all these chi square is also a chi square and in that case, the degrees of freedom of the resulting chi square variate is n 1 plus n 2 plus n 3 up to n n. So, we can sum all this degrees of freedom of the individual chi square and then we will get the degrees of freedom for the new chi square variate. So, with that description, let us move towards this chi-square test. It was actually proposed by Professor Carl Pearson in 1900. So, what we have is small n number of observations from a population which are segregated into k mutually exclusive classes. We can plot the histograms and then we have their k mutually exclusive classes and then we can segregate this n observation into those classes we call sometimes we call it bins. So, you have x i, i ranging from 1 to k and we propose a null hypothesis that means, we propose a distribution for this data. So, null hypothesis is that for the ith class, we have a probability associated small is small p i. Now, from the probability theory, the expected number of observations in the ith class will be 
small m i which we can easily find out that means probability for the ith class times the total number of observations is basically the number of observations we can expect in the ith class. Obviously, the sum of the probabilities p i will be always equal to 1 and sum of these observations in different classes will actually be the total number of observations which is in this case small n. Now, if null hypothesis is correct in limiting sense that means as n tends to infinity we have this variable x square from this observation x i which is given by x square is equal to summation of i equal to 1 to k x i minus m i x i is the observation in the is class and m i is the expected number of observations in the ith class based on the model we have. So, x i minus m i whole square by m i then it follows chi square distributions with k minus 1 degrees of freedom. So, that is the proposal and therefore, if we summarize the chi square test we actually estimate the chi square value from the observation and based on the proposal that we make in our null hypothesis we will explain that with example in a minute. So, we first find out this chi square value based on observation and expected value in the ith class based on some hypothesis. This expected value as I have already explained earlier we can find out based on the probability theory. So, we know the two limits of the bins lower limit and upper limit and the CDF at these limits we can find out and based on the total number of observations we can find out what will be the observation in the ith class. So, for chi square again we have a chi square distribution and then it leads to chi square table that you can see on your screen for different degrees of freedom and different confidence interval and then we can actually find out this chi square table which is available. So, the three steps that we adopt in chi square test is here step number 1 we first propose the null hypothesis obviously you can see on your screen null hypothesis in this case that x follows a population uh, whose distribution is f x of x with some parameter theta that is my null hypothesis. Obviously, alternative hypothesis is that x does not follow that distribution. Now, our first task is to propose this how we propose this again there are some ways actually we can propose this just by looking at the frequency polygon or histogram we can propose this hypothesis and then verify whether our proposal is correct or not. Then from the samples we can find out uh, different uh, parameters. Once that is done we go to the next step where the main aim is to find out this chi square value. Now, this uh, chi square value again uh, we have already explained this uh, uh, mathematical model where we have expected value in the ith class. So, we find out the difference and then square it up and then take the ratio with the expected value in the ith class and then sum up for the complete number of classes we have based on the observations. Then once the chi square value is estimated we are in step 3 then first we evaluate the degrees of freedom degrees of freedom in this case k minus n theta where n theta is actually the number of parameters that we estimate for the null hypothesis where we have a proposal in this case say we have normal distribution if we propose then obviously the number of parameters in normal distribution is 2 because it has mean and sigma. So, the chi square will have a degrees of freedom n which is equal to k minus n theta minus 1 where n theta is the number of parameters in our proposal. So, once that is done then we verify whether the null hypothesis is accepted it is only accepted when the chi square value that we estimate is less than the value that we did from the standard chi square trim. So, let us take an example in this case we have 40 observations from a random test which are mentioned here. Now, we assume this samples come from a population that follows exponential distribution and see with this statement we actually set the null hypothesis with a level of confidence 5 percent and 1 percent. 
Now, we check whether the null hypothesis is accepted or rejected by chi-square test. So, we have this data. Then, as I have described, first in step 1, we set our hypothesis. In this case, our hypothesis is that the population follows exponential distribution. The moment we fix that, we know the expression for uh, exponential distribution and in this case, it has only one parameter lambda. Then based on these samples, we can estimate sample mean and uh, from that we can actually estimate this uh, parameter for the exponential distribution. So, what we know now, first the null hypothesis that we have set as exponential distribution and then based on this data, we have estimated the parameter. So, you can see the histogram uh, on your screen. It actually in a way shows what type of distribution the population follows. In this case, because of this nature, uh, we can conclude that it is exponentially decaying and hence uh, we fit an exponential distribution. And for that, when you plot the histogram, we can calculate the number of beans or number of class from this formula. So, we have in this case, we have figured out the bean width based on the two extreme values and based on that, we actually estimate there are seven beans and we segregate the data in the form of histogram. So, next we continue to stage 2 of this chi-square test. So, we find out the chi-square value. For that, we have identified the class intervals. You can see on the left column. For these different classes, we have altogether 7 classes. We have observations that are segregated under the second column. So, total number of observations, we know it is 40. And then based on our model, we also estimate the expected number of observations in a particular class. Obviously, the total sum of these expected number of observations should match with the total number of observations. As you can see in this case, both of them are 40. Then finally, based on the observed value and expected value, we can calculate the chi-square value as you can see on your screen. And then we first find out the chi-square value for different class and then we sum them up to find out the total chi-square value for the complete observation. And in this case, we have 7 different classes and we estimate one parameter for the distribution because our null hypothesis says it is a exponential distribution having only one parameter. So, the degrees of freedom for the chi-square distribution is 7 minus 1 minus 1 which is 5. And we wish to see whether our null hypothesis is accepted for a confidence limit of 1 percent and as well as 5 percent. So, for these two limits from the chi-square table, we identify what are the critical values and that you can see for 1 percent, the value is 15.0863, while for 5 percent, it is 11.0705. Now, what we can conclude is that our chi-square value estimated from the observation is 9.6519 which is actually less than these two critical values. Because it is less than the two critical values, therefore, our null hypothesis is accepted for uh, both level of significance. And then you can see the CDF based on the observations and the theoretical CDF that we propose after the null hypothesis is accepted. The same problem you can solve in MATLAB, where you can see the uh, MATLAB comments are also shown on your screen. So, the command is CHI to GOF, GOF stands for goodness of fit and CHI is the chi, then chi square goodness of fit is the command. And then for that, first we have to find out the CDF based on the proposed hypothesis that we can easily do. Uh, as I have already explained. And for uh, exponential CDF, in this case, the command is exp CDF and we can find out this and ultimately we can check using 
chi to g o f common in MATLAB. So, this h if it is 0 then it indicates null hypothesis is accepted, if it is 1 then null hypothesis is rejected. So, this problem explains how we actually adopt chi square test. Then we move to a different example where we have 200 test data of concrete cube strength and then you can see the complete table here. What we assume again in this case the population follows normal distribution and then we set two limits 5 percent and 1 percent and check whether the null hypothesis is rejected or accepted by chi square test. So, again the first step we set the hypothesis in this case it is the normal distribution. So, the null hypothesis says yes x the random variable follows the normal distribution and therefore, the expression for pdf is now fixed. Alternative hypothesis rejects that claim that means x does not follow the normal distribution. Now, from the test data we can actually find out sample mean and sample standard deviation and then we can also segregate this into different classes and then you can see the histogram again the shape of this histogram helps us to set the null hypothesis at the very beginning. There are other ways also we can verify whether the how to reach to the null hypothesis, but one of the most important tool is histogram uh, just by uh, looking at this shape of the histogram we can propose the null hypothesis. So, the next task is again to find out chi square value which for different classes we have observed values and then we have expected values. This we have segregated into different classes, but we could also consider the continuous observation as this is the moment we propose this as a continuous random variable for every uh, observations we have we could actually find out chi square value, but both way it is all the same because you can see the total number of observations here also under observation and estimated column both of them are 200. So, we cover the complete test data. And then finally, for individual class we find out chi square value and then sum it up then finally, we get the chi square value for the complete observations that is 200 samples and it turns out to be 2.6825. Now, in this case we have altogether 9 different classes and then we estimate 2 parameters because our null hypothesis is uh, it says normal distributions with 2 parameters. So, the degrees of freedom in this case is 6. Once it is fixed for difference confidence level, we can actually find out the critical value from the chi square table and in this case for 1 percent it is 16.8118 and for 5 percent it is 12.5910. Now, we can see that the estimated chi square value which is 2.6825 is less than the critical value and therefore, what we can conclude that null hypothesis is also accepted in this case. And if you look at the CDF that we estimate from the data and from the theoretical CDF, we can see there is a very nice match between these two which also uh, concludes our null hypothesis is accepted. Now, with that let us move towards the next mathematical model for goodness of fit and that is Kolmogorov Smirnov test. Now, in case test it actually uses the distance between the empirical distribution function based on the data and the CDF of the reference distribution. Now, the aim is to determine the maximum absolute difference between the values of cumulative distributions for a given data and assumed model and then we using that we verify whether our null hypothesis is accepted or not. Now, before we move forward the case distribution is you can see on your screen where this B t is nothing but it is the Brownian bridge. We are not going into the details of that for the time being because our aim is to solve the goodness of fit problem, but just for completeness the cumulative distribution for this Kolmogorov random variable we, we can see on your screen and here as n goes to infinity the sample corresponding to null hypothesis that is from the distribution that we propose it actually converges to square root of n times d n where d n is actually the k s value that I will discuss in a minute. 
this quantity actually converges to Kolmogorov distribution in limiting sense as n tends to infinity. So, what is this capital D n? It is we have already described that it is the absolute maximum value of the difference between the two thing. One is from the empirical distribution you can see f n of x that is it comes from the empirical distribution and then f x which is basically the hypothesis that we set. So, for every observations we find out and then we find out this absolute uh, distance between these two uh, quantities. So, the empirical distribution f n x uh, for n i i d observations independent and identically distributed observations x i you can see on your screen. So, I will explain that in a minute. So, we can estimate based on the observations this empirical distribution. So, uh, if we sum up Kolmogorov's Smirnov test, we can take one sample, we can take two samples also. Let us first take one sample test and in that case, the k statistics for the CDF f x corresponding to null hypothesis, we can see on our screen that is the capital D n which I have already explained and here the empirical distribution f n of x is uh, again given on the screen where this i 1 is basically an indicator function which is either 1 or 0 depending upon the condition you can see on your screen. Now, based on these k statistics we can conclude whether the null hypothesis is accepted or rejected. Null hypothesis is rejected if this square root of n times d n is greater than the critical value that we get from the k s table. That means, probability of k less than equal to k alpha is uh, coming from the uh, given level of confidence alpha and then using that information we can verify uh, whether the null hypothesis is accepted or rejected. Now, let us just quickly review how to evaluate the empirical distribution uh, with uh, further details. So, we have x 1, x 2 up to x n these are the observations with say y 1, y 2 up to y n uh, in the increasing order uh, which is basically the order statistics with no two observations are equal then corresponding empirical distribution f n you can see on your screen uh, based on this expression we can find out the empirical distribution. So, with that let us check the steps in Kolmogorov's Smirnov test. So, these are the different steps that we follow in this case. Again it starts with the uh, null and alternative hypothesis that we set first and then uh, we set the level of significance uh, alpha that we select and then based on observations we first find out empirical distribution f n of x with the expression I have already explained. Then we evaluate f x which is actually the proposal for null hypothesis and then based on these two in step 2 and 3 we find out the k s statistics. Then once we have this k s value then with respect to alpha that is the level of significance and n we refer to k s table to find out the critical value and then check whether the estimated k s value is less than or greater than the critical value and based on that we accept or reject the null hypothesis. So, let us take a problem. We use the same example of 40 observations and then uh, we check whether our hypothesis in that case is accepted or rejected. Remember the population uh, in that example was following exponential distribution and the level of significance is 5 percent and 1 percent in this case. So, you have the same observations here. So, based on that we first set the hypothesis in this case it is the null hypothesis is the population following exponential distribution. So, we can find out the parameters and then again we can segregate the data in different observations. We find out the empirical distribution and then we have the proposed distribution and find out basically k s value. So, you can see uh, using this table we can actually find out the k s value and which in this case turns out to be 0 0.1453 that is the maximum value we can see from this table. Now, for different level of uh, significance again we can calculate uh, 
the critical values which for 5 percent uh, is 0 0.2150 and for 1 percent 0.2577. Now, we see that the case value we obtain from the data is less than the critical values and therefore, uh, based on this test uh, we can conclude that null hypothesis is accepted which is um, exponential in this case. So, the analysis is consi consistent with the conclusions that we made earlier for the same data. So, with that uh, let us conclude here uh, our discussion on theory of probability. Now, we have all the mathematical models uh, needed for the reliability based design. So, in our next lecture we will start uh, our uh, first uh, topic on reliability based design. Thank you very much. Thank you.